Can you hear me? Oh, wait, you're muted. All right. Um, so welcome, guys, to your noon conference today. Um, I've asked a couple of residents to be in the room. So I'm not just speaking to myself and we have an additional fellow. So if there are extra voices, don't be afraid. Um, I've worked tirelessly and had many sleepless nights putting together this talk on plural diseases for everyone. Um, so with that introduction, we'll just jump right in. Um, just so you guys know, uh, any specific plural disease can be an entire hour long lecture on itself. So we're going to try to just simplify things. We'll talk briefly about some plural basics. We'll spend a little bit of time on mechanisms of plural disease, and then we'll talk about common plural disease presentations, focusing on plural lesions, pneumothoraces, and plural effusions. Uh, so to dive right into plural anatomy, um, the pleura is a serous membrane that's made of flat mesothelial cells that just kind of hang out in this suspended layer of connective tissue. Um, there are two layers um, of these uh, of the serous membrane um, that are continuous with one another. The parietal pleura covers our chest wall and is innervated by branches of our phrenic nerve. It courses all the way along the um, chest wall to the apex into the diaphragm, follows the mediastinum until it reaches the hilum, where it invaginates on itself and is continuous with the lung pleura, which we call the visceral. Um, and this visceral pleura, like most organs, are innervated by um, visceral aphantic nerves. And then this invagination of these two layers of membrane create a potential space that we call the intrapleural space. Um, and it's a potential space because this space is actually filled with a small amount of pleural fluid. Um, so you can see here in this image, um, in red, we have our parietal pleura, which runs along our chest wall. You can see just under, I don't think I have a pointer, unfortunately, just under our um, primary pulmonary artery branches, you see this sort of green line where the, the membrane invaginates on itself, and you see a blue line along the uh, lung tissue itself, which is our visceral pleura. And you can see in this zoomed out picture that between those two pleura, you have space where the pleural fluid lives. Pretty simple, not terribly exciting, I know. Um, now, we're talking a little bit about pleural fluid. And just some quick facts, this pleural fluid is produced and absorbed on the parietal pleural surface. Um, in each pleura, we can make about 0.26 milliliters per kg of pleural fluid. Um, and this is due to the balance of hydrostatic and oncotic pressures between the systemic and pulmonary circulation. Um, now, if you think about 0.26 mils per kg on each side, in a 70 kilogram adult, that's about 18 milliliters of fluid in each pleura at any given time. Um, now, the lymphatics absorb this pleural fluid and then drain it into our venous system so it can be recycled just like any other drainage. Um, and an interesting fact is that our lymphatic vessels can actually increase their drainage by a factor of 20. Um, and so you really have significant increase in production of pleural fluid to overwhelm the lymphatic drainage. Um, this increased production of pleural fluid can happen in three ways. Um, either you have too much hydrostatic pressure, you have too little oncotic pressure, and usually it's a combination of both of these factors. Um, so talking about the pleura, what does it do? And surprisingly, this is not a straightforward question. Historically, it was felt that the pleura was an elastic membrane that would allow changes in lung shape during respiration, and that it also helps to prevent atelectasis by being negative um, in the intrapleural space. However, we do a procedure called pleurodesis, which is obliteration of that pleural space, and human beings tend to do just with no change in their function. So there's a debate on whether or not this pleura is actually necessary. Using studies on buffaloes and elephants, if you guys would like to look into them. Um, so the question of is the pleura you know, necessary is a little bit beyond me. I'll leave that to smarter people than me. But I do know that the pleura is a lot of trouble. Um, and that's where we get pleural diseases. 
these plural diseases can present in three ways. Um, I like to keep things simple because I think I remember simple things better. So we're going to simplify this for everyone today. The three ways that plural disease can manifest are you can have air in the plural space, and we call this a pneumothorax. You can have fluid in the plural space, and what we mean by that is too much fluid, and we call this a plural effusion, or you can just have too much pleura. And so we call these pleural lesions, and they typically manifest as pleural thickening, pleural plaques, or pleural tumors. So just like we learned in chemistry that there are three phases of matter, the pleura makes it simple and has three phases of disease that mirror these, solid, liquid, gas. We're going to start off with disease because this is really lowest yield for your board exams, and the questions that you get are going to be pretty simple. So we'll, we'll push through this pretty quick. Um, the first way that solid pleural disease can present is in the form of a pleural plaque. A pleural plaque is a deposition of hyaline collagen fibers that most likely forms on the parietal surface of the pleura, so at the chest wall. Um, there are many things that can cause pleural plaques. The simplest way to think about it is it's typically the result of occupational or environmental exposures. On your boards, they're typically going to be trying to point you towards asbestosis. And the trap that you want to avoid falling into is thinking that a pleural plaque is automatically a mesothelioma, a primary pleural malignancy as the result of asbestosis. Um, in the real world, um, pleural plaques are typically asymptomatic and occur in the absence of underlying parenchymal disease and are often incidental findings on imaging that's been performed for other reasons. Um, moving on, the second way that solid pleural disease can present is with pleural thickening. And this pathology typically starts on the visceral pleura, so next to the lung tissue itself, because it's the result of some sort of intense inflammatory condition. Most intense inflammatory conditions are going to happen in your lung tissue, and the first place it's going to extend is to that visceral pleura that's just abutting it. So simple mechanism, simple pathology. Um, globally, pleural thickening is most commonly caused by infections. Here, empyema. In the world, you can see a lot of tuberculosis pleurisy that's manifested as pleural thickening. Um, pleural hemorrhage can also cause thickening of the visceral and the parietal pleura because uh, blood is very caustic, as we know. And then occupational exposures like asbestosis, silicosis, and then things like trauma, radiation, and primary metastatic um, neoplasms can also cause pleural thickening. And then finally, moving into the neoplastic things, we have the third manifestation of pleural disease, which is pleural tumors. Um, most pleural tumors are going to be malignant. So if you see uh, an imaging study on your boards of a solitary pleural tumor, you should be thinking malignancy. Um, most commonly, this is metastatic disease from lung, ovarian, or breast cancer. Um, but if it's going to be a prior, that's when you want to start thinking about mesothelioma. And then there's some other less common malignancies that can cause that I think are a bit beyond the scope of this talk today. So finishing up uh, with solid pleural diseases, we see some pretty uh, stunning imaging studies. On the left here in this chest x-ray, you can see along the mediastinum as well as periphery, these thick pleural plaques that are calcified. And then if you let your eyes travel down to the diaphragm, you can see calcification riding along that diaphragm. Now, from this chest x-ray, we can't tell what pleura is involved. So if you look at the CAT scan in the upper right, this is actually a CT of the same patient with these pleural plaques. And you can see these um, thickened areas of pleura. And I'm sorry I don't have a pointer in these areas, particularly on the left base, that some of this, these plaques are calcified. Now, for a radiology reason that's a little bit beyond me, we know this is the parietal pleura and not the visceral pleura. Um, the bottom image on the right um, is sort of a more typical thing that we'll see with pleural plaques that are small, not so marked, um, and have a little bit more extensive calcification. And this is something that you typically see with asbestosis, um, not necessarily a primary lung disease. Give you a second to settle in, um, or we'll move on to gaseous pleural disease. Um, gaseous pleural disease is really pneumothorax. And again, in the spirit of being simple, there are really three primary etiologies of pneumothorax, so really three causes you guys got to remember. The first one is a spontaneous pneumothorax. 
And spontaneous pneumothoraces are spontaneous because they occur, they occur without any inciting event. Um, we call it a primary pneumothorax. If the patient has no inciting event, a spontaneous pneumothorax, then they don't have any underlying lung disease. And we call it a secondary spontaneous event if the patient does have underlying lung disease. Now, any parenchymal lung disease can cause a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax. We see it most commonly in practice with COPD, cystic fibrosis. Again, tuberculosis worldwide is a common cause of secondary spontaneous pneumothoraces. And then again, any sort of metastatic or primary lung malignancy can cause those patients to these secondary um, events. Um, one thing that we in this institution quite a bit is um, the spontaneous secondary pneumothoraces occur in the setting of necrotizing pneumonia as the result of thromboembolic disease from endocarditis that caused bronchopleural fistulas. So I just wanted you guys to keep that in mind when you're thinking about these spontaneous pneumothoraces. Next is traumatic pneumothoraces. And this is pretty simple and doesn't need a whole lot of explanation. Someone has an injury that incites a pneumothorax. These are typically incited by penetrating traumas. So any sort of impalement, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, you can let your imagination run wild. Um, traumatic pneumothoraces can also occur in the setting of rib fractures, where a rib will puncture either the uh, parietal or visceral pleura or the lung parenchyma itself, and it's a pathway for air to surround the lung where it shouldn't be. And then these are important because tension, or, um, traumatic pneumothoraces carry a high risk of tension physiology, which we'll talk about in just a little while. The last cause of uh, pneumothoraces that I want you guys to remember are iatrogenic pneumothoraces. These are pneumothoraxes that are our fault. What we have done in the medical community has caused this pneumothorax. Now, I have a table here that's going to come up, I promise, um, that uh, lists um, clinical situations where we're at a higher risk for tension. So not all of these seven etiologies are iatrogenic. What I want to draw your attention to is that many of them are. Um, when patients are on mechanical ventilation through an EP tube, um, if our pressures are too high or we're not really focusing on some of that lung protective ventilation that we like to talk about, we predispose them to barotrauma, which can be a cause of spontaneous pneumoth or I'm sorry, iatrogenic pneumothorax in the ICU. Patients that have received CPR and have rib fracture are also at higher risk of an iatrogenic traumatic um, pneumothorax. And then we have lots of tubes in people, ET tubes, chest tubes, whatever tubes you want to think of, and they become blocked, clamped, displaced. You can't drain the way they're supposed to. We can cause a lot of harm that way. Um, and then this isn't something we see here very much, and this is something that I saw in my training very much, but hyperbaric oxygen does carry some risk of um, iatrogenic pneumothorax. All right. So let's talk about the scary plural um, pneumothoraces, which we call tension pneumothoraces. These are simply still air in the fluid, which is where it shouldn't be. We know from earlier that it's supposed to be fluid. Um, but what's special about tension pneumothoraces, you have contralateral displacement of the mediastinum. That means the mediastinum moves away from the area of air, and this causes cardiopulmonary compromise because it can cause compression of your low pressure right-sided structures, which we know from all of our pH training is a very bad thing. Um, but man, I'm saying lots of big words here. What does this actually mean? So let's take a second and look at a couple of images and two patients that have pneumothoraces and see what's different about them. If you look at the image on the right and the left, you see that you have a nice pleural line where your lung markings abruptly stop. Um, and we can see both of these here on the left and the right. Taking a look at the image on the right of your screen, we want to take a look at our mediastinum. And we see that our trachea and our carina are still nicely in the midline. And because they're still in the midline, we say the patient has a pneumothorax, likely a spontaneous pneumothorax in this case, because we don't see any um, obvious trauma in this uh, chest X-ray, um, but we don't have any tension physiology. In the image on the right, you can see, I'm sorry, on the left, you can see that our mediastinum is shifted to the right. Our trachea are sitting in the right side of our chest. And you can picture in your mind how our right atrium may be compressed um, in this setting, looking at this image. And this is a tension pneumothorax, especially when the patient is hemodynamically compromised. 
All right, so how does this happen? How does attention pneumothorax in one patient but not in another? Why is the patient in the chest x-ray on the right not as sick as the patient in the chest x-ray on the left? And this is because some etiologies will cause a one-way valve to develop, and this valve allows air to um, enter the pleural space during inspiration, and then once the inspiratory pressure or the pleural pressure reaches a threshold, that valve will snap closed passively, and air won't be allowed to escape. So here's a really simple of just that physiology. You can see on the left that as uh, a patient is inspiring, air is able to enter the pleural space. Once that pleural space reaches a certain pressure, that valve passively closes, and all that air is trapped space and isn't um, able to be exhaled. And as that builds up, we'll push the lung and the mediastinum further and further and further. Um, tension pneumothorax is scary because it is a medical emergency. If you don't have immediate intervention on this, patients are at high risk of rapid cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, the long and short of it is stick a needle in it get the air out, but the logistics of how to manage attention pneumothorax are outside of the scope of this talk. If you guys have any questions, I like talking about this stuff, reach out to me, I'll tell you. Um, sort of going back to our simple um, non-tension pneumothorax, um, it's pretty interesting because the presentation is really heterogeneous. Um, presentation of spontaneous pneumothoraces, um, in particular, because with trauma, you know trauma has incited the event, um, it can range from acute onset um, in quick resolution of chest pain, maybe but then acute resolution of shortness of breath, all the way to that tension physiology with acute onset and persistent chest pain and shortness of breath in between. Um, it makes it difficult to know how to manage these patients, so we allow the size and symptoms of these pneumothoraces to guide what we do. In a patient who has a small pneumothorax, which if you look at ATS versus the British Thoracic Society, they define that as less than two to three centimeters, and they have no shortness of breath, no dyspnea, no chest pain after that initial inciting moment. Um, it's pretty reasonable short observational period in the emergency room and close outpatient follow-up. Now, patients with larger pneumothoraces, so more than two to three centimeters, but particularly with symptoms, with dyspnea, with shortness of breath, with chest pain, these need to be intervened on. The first thing you do in any of these patients is you put them on 100% supplemental oxygen. And the reason behind that is we think that by changing the partial pressures of oxygen within the pleural space, some of the other gases, that we can help the body reabsorb the, the pneumothorax, reabsorb the air that shouldn't be there. And then depending on how unstable they are, how young they are, what we is, whether it's primary versus secondary, um, an emergency doctor will consider needle aspiration versus small bore chest tube um, insertion. Sort of the logistics of that, again, are a little bit beyond the scope of our talk. Now, if you have an older patient with a pneumothorax, whether it's small or large, with breathlessness, you put them on that 100% supplemental oxygen, and then you don't even consider needle aspiration. This patient needs a small bore chest tube. Anyone with a chest tube should be admitted to the inpatient side. Then you get your handy dandy pump fellow on board to give you all teaching and help you with the chest tube. Um, so just a, a point to make is our older patients, especially those with underlying lung disease, tolerate pneumothoraces much less well than our younger healthy counterparts. So our threshold to intervene needs to be lower with them because um, lung function they have remaining. And then the last point I want to make on this slide before we move on is that breathlessness in the setting of pneumothorax is actually a herald for impending tension, which is why anyone with symptoms needs to be treated with oxygen and some sort of mechanism to get the air out of the pleural space. Okay, that's the stuff we just talked about. <clears throat> we'll take a breather and we'll move on to liquid pleural disease, which is also pleural effusion which is also the bane of a Palm Fellow's uh, existence on a consult rotation. Um, now, pleural disease is something that I could spend days and days and days teaching you um, and I'd still have more to say. So I'm going to throw a lot of rapid stuff at you. And if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me. Um, many, many cause pleural effusions. Um, in the medical community, we uh, group these into two main based on their underlying characteristics to help us guide not only our um, differential diagnosis, but also our threshold to intervene. 
the first category that we have are transitative effusions. Um, and what transitative means is non-inflammatory. The underlying cause of the buildup of fluid in the pleural space is not inflammation, whereas an exudative effusion is the result of inflammation. Now, again, I've gone and said big words. I've said transidate, I've said exudate. Let's simplify that a little bit. So I spent tons and tons of time trying to think about how to simplify this for you guys. I played with slides, I made animations, and then I went to Google and I found a cartoon that does it simply and easy to remember. So on the left here, we see our transidative effusions. Um, transidative effusions occur in the setting of increased hydrostatic pressures within our systemic or pulmonary capillaries or in the setting of decreased oncotic pressure. Decreased oncotic pressure is kind of synonymous with protein loss. The patient has low protein. Um, and this, in this setting, your vascular epithelial cells are intact. So what you're going to leak across that membrane into your pleural space is going to be low protein, low substance fluids. You can see here the most common causes of that are uh, congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, and then nephrotic syndrome, which are things that we see in the hospital all the time. Um, on the right of this image, you can see an exudative effusion. Looks a little yellow, looks a little pussy, looks like it's worse than, than the other side of this image. And this is because you have an inflammatory event that's causing capillary dilation and increased capillary permeability because those endothelial cells have gotten leaky. When you have leaky endothelial cells, whatever is inside your vessel is going to leak across those vessels, and so you get a pleural fluid that is full of a lot of stuff. Lots of protein, lots of LDH, and other inflammatory markers, and that's the mechanism behind an exudative effusion. Take a look at that in your mind. All right. So, uh, just taking a look, I think this is a great example um, from one of Dr. Light's papers, who is sort of the father of pleural disease. Um, showing how broad the differential for uh, transidative effusions can be. It's not as simple as CHF, cirrhosis, or nephrotic syndrome, although that is by and large what you're going to see in the hospital. You can see here that you have a urinothorax, and let's talk about urine and euthorax. I don't want that there. <laughs> um, and then one other interesting point to draw your attention to is that sarcoidosis, which we think of as typically an inflammatory state, is not uncommonly the cause of transidative effusions. So that's one of those um, things that can trip you up when you're in your clinical practice. But again, we focus mostly on CHF, cirrhosis, and nephrotic syndrome. Um, from that same paper, there's our differential for exudative effusions. Does your brain hurt looking at this? Because my brain hurts looking at this. Um, I just wanted you guys to get a scope of how many things can cause, cause exudative effusions, and you don't need to keep this in your brain all the time. For the sake of our talk today, we're going to focus on two main categories, and those are exudative effusions related to pneumonia, infectious pleural effusions, and malignant pleural effusions. All right, away from the brain hurting. So, um, the next question you ask is, how do I know if a pleural effusion is transidative or exudative? And so here we're going to take a brief pause, and I want everyone to pull out a pen and paper and take 60 seconds and just test you can think of that you would want to figure out whether a pleural effusion is transitative or and the timer will start now. 
right. So um, this is typically the point where I would ask someone to share, uh, but since we're all doing this electronically, I'll just repeat it. Anyone that wrote down liked criteria wins a gold star. So um, anyone that wrote down anything else, don't feel bad. This is why we learn, right? Um, so liked criteria is um, something that you need to know for your boards, for your practice. Um, and this is a criteria that Dr. Light created in the 1970s in order to not miss exit date of a season. So when you're looking at liked criteria, if you meet a single of the following three bullets, you have an exudative effusion, um, an effusion full of lots of stuff. The more positive criteria a patient's pleural fluid meets, the more specific your testing is for an exudative effusion. So we can see here that the three criteria that need to be fulfilled are a pleural fluid uh, to serum protein ratio of greater than 0.5, a pleural fluid LDH ratio of greater than 0.6, and or a pleural fluid LDH that's greater than two-thirds upper limit of normal of your institution's serum threshold, okay? Um, take a look at this. Uh, when you're sending patients to the endo suite or doing um, to IR or we're doing fluorescentesis in the ICU, uh, we typically or we often will fall into the trap of just sending pleural fluid protein, pleural fluid LDH, but it is really important in order to apply LIGHT's criteria um, appropriately to also get a serum protein and a serum LDH within a few hours before or after the pleural fluid was taken. So don't forget that. You want something to make sure they've got a, plur or a serum protein and a serum LDH within a few hours of that fluorescentesis so we can approach the criteria. And then pro tip, like I said, your ABIM and pulmonologists love this. So memorize it, keep it, use it always. Okay, so now that I know that my pleural effusion is a transidate versus an exudate, how do I treat it? Um, transidates are nice and simple because in general, underlying conditions. A great example of this is something that we all see all the time. You get a patient with known HEF-REF or HEF-PEF coming in with pitting edema, volume overload, you get a chest x-ray and it shows bilateral pleural effusion. The best way to manage these effusions in this patient to treat the underlying heart failure. Do some blood pressure control, take some volume off, and if we optimize the heart failure, uh, we'll rebalance our hydro and the pleural uh, lymphatics will eventually be able to drain this pleural effusion again. Exudates, on the other hand, are not so simple and require special attention in special situations. The first situation, or we're going to talk about a couple situations today. Like I said, we'll talk about paranemonic effusions, so infusions as a result of infection, and malignant uh, pleural effusions. There are many other inflammatory conditions that will cause pleural effusions that require special management, but they are beyond the presentation today, and so we're not going to touch on that anymore. Um, so starting with paranemonic effusions, again, this is simply an accumulation of fluid in the pleural space as the result of an adjacent pneumonia or as a result of direct space, which is what we call empyema. Empyema is an infection of the pleura. Um, this is the most common cause of exudative effusions in the United States. And when we're talking about how do I manage an empyema, it's important that we don't just send studies for light criteria that we're thinking ahead. And there are additional studies that can help us. Um, if we test a pleural fluid cell count and differential, a pleural fluid's pH or a pleural fluid's glucose, that can really help us to determine next steps in managing paranemonic effusions. Um, and point of care ultrasound can really help us to look and see whether um, a fluid collection is simple or complex, which will help us in making our management decisions. And when we're talking about management decisions, we're not talking about antibiotics. We're really talking about whether or not a patient needs a check for source control, or whether it's a simple effusion and they don't need a chest tube. So, Things work. Here is a table that's just showing the difference between an uncomplicated and a complicated pleural effusion. So you can see in both it's going to become exudated, but in an uncomplicated pleural effusion, you have a normal fluid pH, pleural fluid pH, excuse me. You have a normal pleural fluid glucose. Your gram stain may not be positive, but you will definitely not have any pus. And when you're doing your point of care ultrasound, the effusion will look simple. Um, the difference uh, in complicated effusions, 
complicated infusions are things that are much more scary because they need to be intervened on for source control. You'll have a low pH, you'll have a low pleural fluid glucose. Um, you'll likely have a positive gram stain in culture, not always, and oftentimes you'll have frank pus. And when you put that ultrasound on the patient's chest, fluid looks really complex. It's not just simple. This matters because patients with complicated effusions need a inserted for drainage of that effusion to help them with source control because antibiotics alone won't be enough in this setting. Whereas with an uncomplicated pleural effusion, antibiotics alone will treat the inflammation. And then again, the body will be able to absorb that simple effusion. Moving on to malignant pleural effusions. Um, these are important to find because malignant pleural effusions have prognostic and staging um, value. If you have a pleural fluid, which is positive for malignancy on cytology, that cancer is automatically considered stage four medical. Um, pleural, fluid, pleural effusions in malignancy can also be a source of morbidity. Um, patients have a lot of shortness of breath. They're frequently hospitalized. They get multiple fluorocentesis and it really decreases their quality of life. So we want to think about how to intervene on these early if we're able to. Um, malignant pleural effusions, uh, well, that sounds nice. They give me staging. If it's positive, it's automatically stage four. But nothing is that simple. And it actually is quite difficult to diagnose malignancy on pleural fluid cytology. So um, your diagnostic sensitivity on your first thoracentesis is about two-thirds. It's about 60%. So when we're looking um, in the literature and for your boards, if your first thoracentesis comes for malignancy, it's recommended to repeat a second thoracentesis and run cytology on that as well. And that second thoracentesis will increase your sensitivity to about 89%. Um, that pattern continues as you repeat thoracentesis, but in terms of success, morbidity, patient comfort, we really say to stop after that second thoracentesis. If you have two pleural fluid uh, samples that come back negative for malignancy and your suspicion is high enough, the literature would support referring that patient to thoracic surgery or um, an IP department that performs video-assisted thoracoscopy and have a pleural biopsy taken. That will give you the same staging and prognostic value. values. Um, and then management of, of uh, pleural effusions, malignant pleural effusions, is also really nuanced. Um, if you treat the underlying malignancy, the pleural effusion will eventually get better. However, if that's not enough or the cancer can't be cured, really management is taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And if you guys want to talk about the details and the nuances of this, we have a very friendly neighborhood IP service that would be happy to dig into that with you. All right? Um, so here, just to finish off our liquid pleural disease, we have two chest x-rays, because I'm a lung doctor and I love chest imaging. On the right, we can see a unilateral um, left-sided pleural effusion um, that ultimately, I believe, was found to be a complicated It was actually um, an empyema, so this patient ultimately got a chest tube, whereas on the right, we see these bilateral pleural effusions in a patient with um, lots of pulmonary edema, maybe some compressive atelectasis, and some really vasculature, and this patient was um, one of our very common heart failure patients. This patient was diuresed over time um, and eventually improved, and so this just illustrates the, the sort of stark difference between sort of different pleural effusions. All right? So in summary, what I want you guys to take away from this today is there are three main pleural disease manifestations, too much air, too much fluid, or too much pleural, all right? Um, in patients that have pneumothoraces, if they have symptoms, if they're breathless, that air needs to come out somehow, and they should be placed on 100% uh, supplemental oxygen. And then pleural effusion is really a heterogeneous, broad category of disease. We really need to utilize our LIGHT criteria when we determine which pathway of management to go down. Um, complicated paranemonic effusions get a chest tube for source control. And then malignant pleural effusions have staging and prognostic value. So would recommend to tap it once, tap it again, but really after that second tap, don't tap it three times. All right, that's all I've got for you guys today. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's a lot to digest. We've got a question in the chat box.
Applegate. Um, most causes of pleural hemorrhage will be the result of some sort of trauma, some sort of trauma or iatrogenic uh, complication. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any spontaneous causes of pleural hemorrhage. I will do a little bit more reading and get back to you with a more um, formal answer. to pneumothoraces, if someone were to come in relatively small, but they have some mild symptoms, you start them on 100% oxygen, how quickly should you expect to see improvement? And do you titrate them off of the oxygen? Or how exactly does that kind of as you're managing over time? That's an excellent question. If I am reaching for a non rebreather to give someone 100% oxygen, I'm also reaching for some sort of kit to get that air out of their, their pleural space. 100% um, is not typically enough to get uh, the reabsorption that we want with the rapidity that we want. And so I would intervene with a needle fluoroscopy or a small bore chest tube in that direction as well. Garbarino, who has uh, graciously joined us today, uh, is totally right. Um, if you're reaching for the supplemental oxygen at 100%, um, you really should be trying to find a way to get that air out. Um, and there's really no efficacy in keeping on 100% non rebreather for an extended period of time. Any more questions? You guys have great ones so far. Well, I asked about. I looked up because I didn't know the answer to, but it basically the answer is lateral. Uh, Joy has another question. Is there any significance between left and right effusion? Is there any significance? Uh, basically, no. um, is there, it, is it something more likely to be transudative or exudative? Is no, uh, there's no difference between sidedness. Um, if you have a unilateral uh, effusion that is new, whether it's on the right side or the left side, um, in most cases that fluid should be sampled with at least a diagnostic, if not a therapeutic thoracentesis, because the risk of, ex risk of exudative effusion is equal. Now, the special case of a right-sided transudative effusion in the setting of hepatic hydrothorax is sort of a unique entity um, and so if you have a clinical picture of a patient with bad cirrhosis, elevated portal pressures, long history of ascites with a unilateral um, right-sided effusion, um, you can be pretty confident that that, that um, is a hepatic hydrothorax, which is a transudative effusion. But on most pulmonologists would say that that should still be sampled with a diagnostic, if not a therapeutic thoracentesis. It looks like we don't have any more questions. Again, this is something that me and I'm sure all the other Palm Fellows really like talking about. So if you have any questions or any of you are interested in point of care ultrasound, please just reach out to us, ask. We're always happy to teach. We're always happy to, to show you more hands-on stuff. So um, that's what we're here for. All right, thanks for your attention, guys.